sentence taken out later. Yes. Would you recommend that that be left out or I replaced? I would recommend strongly that it be left out. I opposed it initially. Interesting case studies, which they circularize throughout the country to all mayors, uh, when they find uh, some program, for example, in Chicago that's particularly effective, this information is transmitted. It's called the Urban Observatories, in which uh, much of this information, not just in the area of poverty, but the whole field of urban affairs, uh, would be uh, you know, collected and at the same time transmitted uh, throughout the country through the utilization of various urban universities across the country. Through agreement about the desirability of income maintenance, then we are to a feasible way of providing it. Some form of experimentation, carefully devised, geographically selected, seems essential. Question, is the poverty program being considered as a vehicle for such experimentation, and shouldn't it? Similarly, national sentiment seems to be moving towards broader and more flexible grants and shared taxes, the revenues, from the federal government to the states and local units. Yet the poverty program is tending in the opposite direction, from the general to the categorical, from the discretionary to earmarked funds, should such be the case. Now, did you have a chance to see or look at the, the newspaper accounts of the testimony we had on Monday when we asked these five representatives of the poor from all over the country what they thought about income maintenance? And I think there were two of them for it and three of them against it. And uh, this is to my way of thinking, symbolic of the difficulties in a democracy as to how you're going to move into a new area of this sort. I would say as a politician that we're many years away from income maintenance today. Perhaps I'm wrong. Uh, you are already convinced intellectually that it's a good thing in, in principle. How do we bridge that gap in a democracy? I am not necessarily yet, Senator, convinced. But I think the program, the Community Action Program, and the Poverty Program itself were created by a number of us uh, to be a research and development operation for the nation on these problems. And I think that when you get ideas uh, with growing consent, uh, like the income maintenance program, it would be very healthy if we could experiment before we uh, break it on the country generally. And I suspect probably in the reactions you got on Monday, you got some of this surprise, that is, not having heard about it before, not having tested it out, uh, it's pretty hard to respond uh, uh, with much foresight uh, or much uh, judgment. And we think that if we could use community action as a way in a few selected places, not just with local staff, but with federal agencies and, and some of our major economists working with us, we might be able to test out, does it make sense or does it not make sense? But we need the flexibility to make a test of that kind. My colleagues will speak for themselves, but I suspect they'd agree with me that income maintenance plan as of today is not a practical <coughs> political reality or possibility. I wouldn't disagree, but I do think it would be helpful to you, perhaps, we would think so, if some of us might test it, if we could find political support in our own jurisdictions to do so. I listen to three general areas. One is a definition of the need that exists now in the state. Two, some brief description of existing metal, key existing federal programs and their inadequacies. And three, where we need to go and the need for federal action greater and a more affirmative federal action in, in meeting the causes and the needs of poverty in the state. After two civil rights bills and the third year of the poverty bill's operation, the situation of the Negro in Mississippi is that he's poorer than he was, he has less housing, He's as badly educated. He's almost in despair. We face now a major, major crisis in the Mississippi Delta as a result of minimum wage, which I think Mr. Carr spoke to you about earlier. One of the sad things is that none of us know really the extent of the poverty and the dislocation that's resulted from mechanization and from the minimum wage bill. Ms. But Wright, did you hear Mr. Carr testify? I read Mr. Carr's testimony. Uh, were you impressed with it? I agree with some of it. I think that he did not, again, go into the dimensions of this, and I'd like to sort of add some additional Yes, I think in the course of what you tell us this morning, you might comment to the extent you think it desirable on his pr presentation. Yes, sir. Well, as he pointed out, there has been a, a gradual trend in the Delta toward mechanization, and right now, those people who had only the skills of chopping and picking cotton have absolutely nothing to do. And the Delta Council of the Mississippi Plantation Owners estimates According to a New York Times article recently that approximately 8,000 families were dislocated as a result of minimum wage and the ending effects of mechanization. Now, this is a tragic, tight situation. 
We don't really know how many people are involved. I'm told that a recent study which is going to be released says about 54,000 people. Again, one of the things we've been trying to get but have been unsuccessful Stop in getting. Stop just a minute. You're giving us some very valuable testimony. I'm just a little worried. You're going so fast that Snyder was not getting it all. How about that? All right. <laughs> I will try to slow down. I know, it's cruel and barbarous treatment, we all know it. None of us are completely clear about the dimensions of this problem. We know it's huge. And one of the things we've been seeking without success is to get some federal agency to do a comprehensive study of the extent of dislocation as a result of minimum wage and mechanization. I think that is an immediate need. Now, what are we going to do with these people? Frankly, I don't know. Here you have a number of people who've never had any skills, who are basically illiterate in large part, who have little housing, absolutely no place to go, no jobs, and no hopes of getting any. Now, this problem has got to be faced. The single largest problem facing all of us in Mississippi right now is how can people eat during the winter? The begging, the meetings that we're holding where numbers of people come and we ask them to stand up and almost nobody in that meeting of hundreds have jobs or have any hopes of getting jobs. This is an urgent situation which must be looked into and which must be met. All right. Now, that goes into one of the existing programs which is key. Last year, in the last couple of years, one has had a free commodity distribution plan. One sees an increasing trend in Mississippi toward food stamps. This is causing a major crisis just in meeting the hunger problem. As a result of this, one finds, say, in Jones County, for instance, which these are Civil Rights Commission reports, which have gotten figures from the Department of Agriculture. But in Jones County, for instance, participation dropped from about 17,500 people who were on food commodities to a little under 4,700 in March. Now let me translate this into human terms, and this trend goes on in several other counties, and I'd like to submit some of this data for this committee so that you can look at the impact of food stamps on people who were on food commodities. Let's translate this to people who have no income. Take one example of a woman in LaFleur County with six children, absolutely no income, she has not worked, she was cut off welfare, and we think illegally, but she simply cannot feed her kids because she was totally dependent on food commodities for that existence. She cannot afford the minimum amount for food stamps. Let's take the second example of a woman in Washington County who is a welfare recipient, who makes approximately $60 a month, who has seven children, who has to pay rent, light, water, and who cannot meet the minimal requirements of food stamps. And asking several of the people in the state what responses they're going to make to this kind of situation, the only thing they can say is, I guess they'll have to starve. Now, this is absolutely untenable. Nothing that I see in the law requires that there be a financial requirement for food stamps. And somehow, some adjustment in the regulations of the food stamp program must be made to aid and provide food for those people who cannot afford it and who have no income or little income at all. Well, now, if that were to occur, I would think uh, almost anywhere else in the country, those people go on public assistance. Is there no public assistance in that area? Yes, sir. That's my next issue. And I brought for the committee a report that we have done in starting to examine federal programs in the state. Mississippi welfare programs are terribly inadequate. Mississippi determines what need is and decides they'll give the recipients 31 percent of that need. Now, you take that, and that's an increase from 26 percent in the last six months to the 31 percent level now. So even if one is on welfare, that's terribly inadequate to survive on. Can you uh, give us some <coughs> rough idea in terms of dollars a week for, say, a family of four or a family of eight, whatever it might be, what that assistance at the state and local level would be? The maximum, say, ADC, which is the maximum program, in which is the major welfare program in Mississippi, the aid to dependent children, the maximum anybody can get with I don't care how many children is $90 a month. Now, the average payment for one child is $9 a month, and this sort of increases with other children, but up to the limit of $90. I have, and this is all documented for the committee, a detailed study of welfare assistance, the levels of payments, and the maladministration, which is the next point. Because even with the 31 percent, many people who should be getting that aren't getting it. And we have been able to document and have before for this committee today. Can you understand me? Or am I still going too rapidly? 
Well, I understand. I'm just worried about this. The court story. reporter. See, we'd like to preserve this for posterity. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> quite apart from the 31 percent inadequacy. 31 percent of need. Of need inadequacy. And right. I imagine the determination of need. Perpetuating the cycle of poverty in the state of Mississippi. Uh, this. How is that? One is that. Just look at the employment figures. I'll take three or four key key federal programs, Employment Security Commission, where we have numerous complaints every day of discriminatory referrals, and at most what Negroes can get by going to the Employment Security Office is the same old domestic-type jobs. The employment of Negroes in this program, which is 100% federally assisted, can be counted, uh, those above janitor or mates of that kind, can be counted in one hand. Welfare Department employment pro practices almost non-existent as it applies to Negroes, and you find almost no Negroes existing in these programs. Are there Negroes in the Welfare Department? Very, very few, and we've been trying again to get this kind of information. I have never seen a welfare, there are few welfare social workers in a place like Jackson, but in the overwhelming number of counties, there are not a single Negro employed, either in the Employment Security Office or in the Welfare Department, in any position above janitor. The Agriculture Department, again, which has a tremendous amount of influence in programs, is on the whole still basically segregated both in services and in its own employment practices. Almost no federal agency has begun to approximate compliance requirements of Title VI. And there's an immediate need for a review of these programs in terms of Title VI to see, one, they're reaching the people for whom they're intended to serve, two, that they employ people on equal basis. The extension service discrimination and segregation, which was documented by the Civil Rights Commission report, has exchanged very little. And the administration of these programs must be looked into and to assure that everybody's going to get the benefits that they're entitled to get. One can look at schools and HEW compliance practices, and we see in Mississippi today, after 12 years of Brown and after numerous school desegregation cases, very few Negro children in white schools. And again... Stop for just a second. I want to make a brief statement off the record. <coughs> I apologize for eating my lunch while sure, you're right. testifying, but I have another appointment I must go to. I'm afraid it'll be before you get through, and I thought you wouldn't mind if I no, just munched while you went ahead. Back on the record. But let's move to the poverty program, because for many people, the poverty program held out the largest hope. And I think it's also held out the largest disappointment in many ways. I agree very much with most of the basic articulated goals of the poverty program, and I certainly support the concept of community action. But in examining how these are actually functioning in Mississippi, one sees several trends. One does not see cap structures which are representative or democratic in any real way. One finds that the money and the cap boards are going through the very same power structures that created or helped create the poverty problem in the first place. Too often, I think there's been an assumption by the OEO that any Negro represents poor people, and this is not true. Unless the concept of democratically elected representatives is implemented in the state of Mississippi, we're going to continue to see middle-class Negroes picked by white boards of supervisors, put on cap boards, mainly for their effectiveness in parroting the white community. There must be democratically elected boards which are representative of the poor, and OEO's cap boards are falling far below these standards today. Now, Mr. Carr told us, as I remember, it, <coughs> that the Negroes in the Dela area... Here is also a county where you have a strong Negro leadership, a strong traditional NAACP chapter, but in those Delta counties which are one poorer, where there's less organization, there's still a huge amount of fear. There's still the huge amount of economic dependence on the white power structure on the plantation owners, and we're making very little inroads in the right to vote. And again, the key to that is some kind of hope in terms of federal programs which are going to feed development more as a response to the few independent poverty programs that have come up, and more out of desire to control the poverty funds that are coming to that community rather than a commitment to poverty. I think the community action concept has been based on the assumption that there are many separate groups in the community who are interested in eradicating poverty, but I think that the whole experience of Mississippi defies that. You have two very distinct communities, white and Negro, who have been at loggerheads. All right? Who have been at loggerheads. And some kind of processes must be designed to ensure the cap structures which are formulated do represent the entire community. And there are many ways to do this, I think. <coughs> One is that I think the openness requirement which is provided in the Office of Education, the Economic Opportunity Act, is a good one. 
but in fact is not being used. And people in the local communities, poor, Negroes, and whites, are not getting the information <coughs> regarding these programs. They must have open policies. It takes a lot of guts for the average poor Negro in the rural Mississippi County to go and request a copy of the proposal. And so often they're turned down. OEO must assure that information is going to be disseminated to all elements of the community so they can, they can be aware. Too often what we've seen is that cap structures have come up, have been there, have already had their representatives chosen, and people have had no involvement. As a result, many Negroes have refused to participate in these cap structures because they felt they've not represented them. And two, they've seen those people on the cap boards who've been their enemies traditionally in past years. And let's take Sunflower County, for example, where the sheriff of of one of the, of the county was sort of temporary chairman of the CAP board. And this is a sheriff that we have been able to document, which the Civil Rights Commission reports documented, had traditionally been hostile to Negro citizens. Great pressure has been put on OEO again and again to reorganize these CAP structures. And OEO is making some effort in that direction. The Negro community pending this and in their recent hearings